Okay guys, <clears throat> this is going to be part one of what's probably going to be a long series on uh, scratch building a vacuum tube amplifier. And what I'm showing you here is where we're starting. Um, we're going to start out with a blank aluminum chassis like this. Um, I ordered this one online. Um, you can also make one out of uh, sheet aluminum. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, but we're going to start with a blank chassis and when we're done we're going to have our own custom built uh, stereo amplifier. Now I want to kind of take this first part one to walk you through some of the things. Let me put this down here. Um, to walk you through some of the steps that I use that I've kind of developed how I do it over the years for designing my own amplifier. Okay. Um, I kind of printed this all out to try to make it a little bit easier to follow and uh, I'll go through it with you right now. So the first thing you want to do when you want to build your own amp is to determine the application for the amplifier. What, what are you going to use it for? So there's a mono audio so that's just your basic old-fashioned mono amplifier that you would see in the 1940s and 50s or earlier. Stereo audio, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, your own, you know, like a stereo amp. PA and instrument amplifiers, like public address. And uh, last but not least, guitar amplifier. Now, why would we care with what you're going to use it for? Well, the reason is there are a lot of differences when you're considering the design of an amplifier um, that differentiate the application of these. All right, these first two are designed to cover all of the audible frequency spectrum. In other words, you want them to reproduce the sound as clearly as possible um, and as accurately as possible to. Uh, you know, to, to what it was like when it was recorded. All right. All right, sorry about that. Had to take a call. Um, a PA, an instrument amplifier, doesn't necessarily do that. They're designed to be very loud, to project the sound over a large area, and you'll find that a lot of them are more mid-rangey. There's less treble and less low bass. Um, they're designed to reduce the amount of feedback that you get from live performances and so forth and to project the sound of vocals, okay, whether it's speech, singing, whatever. So they're designed differently. And last but not least, the guitar amplifier uh, couldn't be more different than a regular audio amplifier. And the reason being is a guitar amplifier is part of the instrument, if you ask me. I mean, this is my opinion. Um, the guitar is one part of the instrument, the amplifier is the other part. And choosing what type of design of amplifier you use for your guitar, it really affects the sound of the guitar. And a lot of times, these are designed to purposely have distortion and harmonics um, to break up, you know, under load. And with audio amplifiers, the total opposite is true. You want it to be as clean and pure of a sound as possible. You never want it to distort. You never want it to break up. You never want it to color or change the sound. Um, whereas this does color and change the sound. I mean, an electric guitar is nothing but a metal string vibrating in front of a magnetic field and being picked up with a, with a coil. And that's a pretty bland sound if you've ever heard it alone, if you put it on an oscilloscope. But once it goes through that amplifier and gets changed um, by the characteristics of a guitar amplifier, that sound gives you that classic guitar sound that we're all so used to hearing. So I'm going to choose a stereo audio amplifier. This is what we're going to do in this particular series. And later on, I'm probably going to do a small guitar amplifier to show you some of the differences. Um, I haven't built one of those in a while, so I want to do one of those as well. Okay, 
Step number two, you have to choose the design from the output section back. And the reason you need to do that is the most expensive components um, and the power of the amplifier, all those things are determined by the output section. So your output transformer, the type of tubes you're using, um, from those, you know, if it's a single-ended transformer, you're going to have a single-ended amplifier. If it's a push-pull transformer, you're typically going to have a push-pull amplifier, although you can wire a push-pull for single-end. Um, the impedance of the transformer. Uh, not just the impedance for the speaker that it drives, but the impedance for the plate load that it drives. Um, all those things are going to determine what type of output your amplifier is going to have. And last but not least is the tubes. Okay. Um, each vacuum tube has its own characteristic. So you can't use the same transformer that you would use on a great big transmitting tube or a big power tube, you know, like a 6550 or something. You can't use that on a small tube like a 6AQ5, 6BQ5, 6V6, things like that. So output tube type and transformer type kind of work together hand in hand to determine what type of output you're going to have. Okay. Um, now, in my case, and a lot of times you make these decisions based on what you have. Now, if you're purchasing your equipment, okay, and you're purchasing all of your hardware, you have more latitude. You know, then it's a matter of preference what you want to do with your amp, what you want it to do. But let's say you just have some spare transformers laying around and some spare tubes then that's going to kind of steer the direction of to what kind of amplifier you can build with what you have. All right. So in my case, I ordered a couple of transformers I wanted to try out from uh, Edcore. Edcore is a company, it's an American company. Um, a lot of their transformers are made to order, so there's a six-week lead time as there is on the ones that I ordered. But basically, I ordered a small set of 15-watt push-pull uh, transformers that are 8K um, primary impedance, which 8K primary impedance, or 8K ohms impedance, is uh, the exact transformer you want for a EL84 slash 6BQ5 type vacuum tube output. So I'm actually going to go with a push-pull and I'm going to go with a 6BQ5. Now what does that tell us? If you look at the characteristics of those things, um, a 6BQ5 is going to limit your power. If you just use two of them in push-pull, you're going to have roughly anywhere from a 10 to 15 watt amplifier. Okay, And the design of your power supply and your output and feedback and all those things are going to come together and they're going to kind of determine what that output's going to be. Okay, We can kind of calculate it, but you really don't know exactly, totally what you're going to have until you get it all put together and measure it once it's done. In my opinion, it's more important to worry about how pure and clean and accurate the sound is, uh, undistorted it is, than worrying about counting watts, how many watts I can get. It's You want to understand that a 3 to 5 watt amplifier can have the same good sound as a 100 watt amplifier, just not as loud. Okay, So when you're listening at low volume levels, both amplifiers can perform very similarly. So if you're not worried about high volume and you're just worried about sound and performance, you may not necessarily need to spend the money or the trouble of a very high powered amplifier which is where I'm at. The other downside of a high-powered amplifier is great big tubes require great big power supplies. Okay, So uh, let me get a couple tubes out. I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, here we have four different types of output tubes. Okay, And uh, they have the same components inside, but they are also, so they're very similar in many ways, but in other ways they're very, very different. And this is a good example of how this can really determine what type of amplifier you're going to have to design. This first one is called a 6K6. 
and it is a small, uh, I think it's a tetrode or a pentode tube. Uh, six mean, well, 6K6, so there's six elements, we know that, or because of the six there. K is the, the design of the tube, and the first letter, number, which is six, means it's a six volt filament. Okay, so six volt filament, type K, with six active elements inside the tube. Okay, so basically this tube is what you would find in an old radio. Okay, so actually this would be something that would be in the old Halicrafters radio we just did the rest restoration on. You also will see these on the old Philco and Zenith radios and so forth. Clear back in the 1930s, 1940s, probably 1940s more, um, you'd see these kinds of tubes. They're actually, for their physical size, they're relatively low power. This is going to be maybe a 5 watt tube. Okay. Um, even in push-pull, you're maybe only going to get about 7, 8 watts. Uh, that's it, if that. So, that's one tube. The next one's the one we're going to use, and this is an EL84 or a 6BQ5. Now, this is a beam power pentode tube. It's very similar to an EL34. It's kind of like the little brother to the EL34. And these ones can do two tubes in push-pull anywhere between 10 and 15 watts, depending on the design. Okay, They're very clean. They're very, very popular tube today. Um, they're used a lot in modern vacuum tube amplifiers. They're used in guitar amplifiers as well as audio amplifiers. Okay, This is the one we're going to use. Com comparing, though, this is called a KT100, which is the same as a KT88, a KT90, a KT, you know, the, all those, the 6550, all very, very, very similar to one another. And these tubes can, can put, this one is technically rated to be up to 100 watts for a pair of them, although I would never push them to that limit. More realistically, any of that series, you're going to be talking a 50 to 60 watt amplifier, push-pull, okay? Single-ended is going to be less than half of that. Single-ended, we may only get, you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 watts of that, okay? Um, again, it's a beam power tube, meaning it's, you know, it's basically a tetrode type tube, I believe. Um, it has a, you know, it has your anode, your cathode, your control grid, your, your signal grid, and then it also has the, uh, you know, your your G4 grid we call it. Okay, um, all of those elements work together, and uh, this size of a tube, like I said, is going to be 50 to 60 watt push pull. Now you would think, moving to this one, that if you know, as we get physically bigger in size, the, the amplifier will get physically more powerful. But really, that's not always the case. Um, this is an original RCA 845 transmitting tube. Okay? And it was originally designed for radio transmitters. However, they've become very popular in what we call the single-ended amplifiers that just use one tube. Now, you would think this would put out a whole ton of power. Um, however, the amplifier that this came out of actually came out of the local movie theater. And there was a, uh, you know, a movie theater that was built in the 1920s in uh, the hometown I grew up in. And this amplifier was tucked away. It was an old, um, what was it? it? I don't think it was an RCA amplifier. Um, but it was an old theater amplifier anyways. And uh, I still have it actually in a storage unit. It's a great big heavy steel thing. It must weigh 200 pounds. But basically it used two of these in push-pull configuration. Now this is a triode tube. It only has an anode, a cathode, and a signal grid. Okay, There's no other grids in it for uh, acceleration or any kind of thing like that. Um, it's literally just three elements plus the filament, and 
in push-pull configuration, that big, huge, massive amplifier that weighed a ton, um, only was rated at 40 watts, okay? And that was pushing these things pretty hard. Um, they use exceptionally high voltage. The voltage on this thing was about 1,200 volts. Um, and they used a mercury, uh, mercury vapor rectifier tube that glows, you know, brilliant blue when they when they work. Um, it's a really impressive amplifier to look at when it's running. And uh, so that's basically what this one is. But it's really not a very high powered tube compared to these ones. It's not as efficient. By not having, you know, not being a tetrode or a pentode tube, they don't have the amplification and they and so forth that these ones do. However, being a triode and having very few elements in them, these have a very beautiful sound. Um, they're, they're actually treasured for that reason. This one, um, there are the 300B, Western Electric 300B extra, or, uh, vacuum tubes, uh, the 811s. Um, there's quite a few. There's a few, or the 2A3. They're all great big, started out as like a transmitting type tube, and they're, they're valued for how pure the sound they produce when used as a single-ended amp. So if you wanted to do a single-ended, this would, this would kind of be where you'd be. And then you'd need a special output transformer and so forth to do all that. So that gives you a little idea of uh, how this is going to determine what we're going to build. Okay. Um, the other thing is output transformers. I could do an entire series on that alone. Um, there are different designs of output transformers. Uh, the simplest one is a is a single-ended, which is basically two coils of wire. It has a secondary, just a single secondary winding, and a single primary winding. And the primary winding is high impedance, and the secondary winding is low impedance, and it matches the impedance, and it takes the high voltage, high impedance of the tube, and steps it down to a lower voltage, higher current, low impedance of a speaker. That's the purpose of an output transformer. So the transformer has to match the tube. Each tube has a different plate resistance characteristic. It's an impedance, okay? And the way we determine that is by looking it up on the tube chart. Now I don't know if I actually have a tube chart handy that I can show you right now that comes with one of these tubes. But let me look here. I have a little stack of paper. Here's one. So here's for a 6BQ5. All right. And you can see these are your plate characteristics. And it shows you, okay, like for instance, we'll look at this one. This one is if you look at the um, the voltage that you're applying to the plate or to the anode of the tube, okay, and you follow the chart, it'll show you, okay, with a certain with a certain grid voltage, control grid voltage, okay, how many milliamps of current the tube can conduct, okay. So you can go through all these, okay, the other one is going to be when you put voltage on the grid, what kind of plate current that transmits to, okay, and then each curve shows you a voltage that's applied to the tube, and again, you can use these charts, all right, to determine the operating characteristics of the amplifier. It also, I don't know if I have the whole, let me show you besides the chart, I wanted to show you an actual chart. Let's see here. There we go. Here, I found one. Okay. 6BQ5. And I think I got another one up here. If I can find it, bear with me. Here. This is what you would 
and you can download these off of the internet they're uh, readily available but it shows you the pin out of the tube so you see your screen grids you see your um, your control grid um, you see your filament your cathode your anode all that what pin it's connected to electrically but more importantly it shows you the characteristics of the tube and this is what we're really interested in average characteristics when we look load resistance okay for this particular type of tube okay when you're putting a certain amount of voltage a certain amount of grid voltage 8 volts they want a load resistance of 7000 ohms now that is what helps you to determine and this is for just a class A which is a single ended amplifier you would want to set for this particular performance level okay 250 volts on the plate 250 volts on the screen grid that means that you're tying them together and you're running this tube in as a triode tube in other words that's what that does you're not by not having a different voltage uh, potential at each you know between the anode and the screen grid you're you're running it in triode mode single-ended you would want a 7000 ohm uh, impedance transformer okay we're doing a class a push-pull amplifier okay class AB1 push-pull and for that if you notice it requires an 8k 8k ohms or 8000 ohms okay and you can see 250 volts we can actually get 3% distortion to produce about 11 watts of plate dissipation and on this one with 300 volts we can get 17 watts now again look at the look at the distortion we certainly don't want that so really you're not going to run these at these maximum values like that okay but by looking at these charts we can match the tube up to the transformer very important that your transformer and your tube match one another if they don't none of this is going to work for you okay you're going to have problems with the design and at the very least if you have a mismatch of impedance between your tube and your and your output transformer it will reduce the performance of the amplifier if nothing else and could possibly make the amplifier sound bad or not work at all or oscillate motorboat as they call it it can cause all kind of problems or excessive current flowing through the tube all kinds of things okay all right let's clear this off and we'll go to the next step okay our next thing is our power transformer now once again the power transformer if you don't have a good power supply none of this is going to be worth a hill of beans so as you saw on that little tube chart it's wanting a certain voltage in there okay our power supply has to produce that voltage you, if you put a 400 volt power uh, transformer and you rectify it you're gonna have more than 400 volts you're going to exceed the ratings of this amplifier okay absolute maximum rating for a plate on a tube on a 6BQ5 is 300 volts I put 400 on there I'm going to ruin my tube really fast okay another call sorry so the power supply has to be able to handle the uh, the voltage it has to be enough voltage but not too much the other thing is what kind of power supply the, are you using a uh, solid state or a tube rectifier we're getting into that a little bit later but if you do do you have the filament windings can the filament windings of the transformer handle the number of filaments um, if you have a stereo amplifier that's a lot of filament current you better have a big filament winding on your transformer the other thing is if you work out your design of your amplifier and you come to the conclusion that that whole amplifier is going to draw about 150 milliamps let's say I'm just pulling a number out of a hat you have to double that because now you have two 
two of those amplifiers for stereo. So this transformer has to put out double whatever your amp design is. Because you're putting, you're doubling your amp. You're making two channels. So you have two complete amplifiers. So if each amplifier draws 150 milliamps, you have to have a 300 milliamp transformer. Okay? And you have to also calculate for losses. Um, you know, your, your power supply is going to have resistance losses and the wires and so forth. So if it needs 300 milliamps, you don't want a 300 milliamp transformer. You want a 500 milliamp transformer. You want to exceed the, the spec so that the, amp, the transformer is not going to run real hot and overload and overheat and wear out. So transformer is another, the next important thing. Okay. Now, with that in mind, you want to rough out the design for that power supply. Okay. Um, are you going to use a tube or are you going to use a solid state rectifier? Okay. So, example, case in point here. If I, let's see, if I take this out, there's a new old stock, there's an old, uh, actually a recertified type 80 rectifier. This is similar to a 5U4, only just with the old style, 1930s style pins. But there's a typical rectifier if you're going to use a tube rectifier. Now there's a bunch of different ones and they all have a little bit different characteristics, but they all do the same thing. Okay, um, They rectify the AC into DC, or shall I say one direction rippled <laughs> AC. Uh, we'll get into that later. However, this is the equivalent of that, actually two of them. Okay, because this has two rectifying elements in it. It's a full wave. So I can have these two things here, which are good for a thousand volts, or I can have this here, which is good for about five or six hundred volts. Okay. Um, I know that sounds ridiculous, but and this thing has a, a filament that draws a lot of current. This is very inefficient, and there's a big voltage drop. Um, when the voltage passes through this. So if you have, you know, uh, 100 volts going into the, the tube, you're only going to, this one, you may only have 75 volts coming out of it. There could be a 20 to 30 volt drop um, across the tube from that junction between the anode and cathode, okay? Whereas this is only going to have 0.7 of a volt. Okay, so a little over half of a volt drop, less than one volt. What does that mean? That means this is going to determine what kind of transformer we need. Um, if I need 300 volts and I have this, I'm going to have less voltage drop, so I have the full 300 volts coming through these be before the capacitor and so forth. Whereas this one, if I have 300 volts, I'm only going to have 270, 280 volts coming out of this, meaning I have to plan for that. I have to, I have to compensate for that, and you need to think about that when you're designing your power supply for your for your amp. Okay, um, there's pros and cons to both of these. I particularly like, even even with the negatives of a tube, I prefer to use a tube. A couple of reasons. Number one, a vacuum tube takes time to heat up because it takes time to heat up, it allows the other tubes to heat up. Therefore, you're not dumping all that high voltage directly into the capacitor bank and then directly into the tubes that aren't heated yet. Um, you could potentially put a very high potential across your other vacuum tubes before they heat up because they're not conducting and you have an open circuit, there's no resistance, your voltage goes sky high. That can cause shorts and, and problems in your tubes and shorten the life of your tubes, whereas this brings it up softly, okay? Um, these are a little more forgiving under load, too, all right? They kind of have a cushion to them, all right? A lot of people believe, especially the guitar folks out there, believe that that cushion attributes to partially to the vacuum tube sound, so 
they plant, you know, in some cases they say, hey, you don't have the full vacuum tube sound unless you have a vacuum tube power supply, a vacuum tube rectifier. And again, that's all a matter of opinion, and that's all what people prefer, what they like. But it's a decision you have to make, something to think about. Okay? Now, these will work, but they're not my favorite. Um, if I'm making a high end amplifier, I prefer to use these Hexfred, Hexfred, H E X F R E D diodes. Um, they're a standard, they are a silicon diode, but they are very fast when you switch them into reverse, like when, when the voltage reverses on your transformer, your AC wave go, you know, goes zero crosses and goes the opposite direction. This does a much better job of blocking that right away. Okay, these have a lot faster reaction time, and a lot of them have very heavy voltage and current ratings. These are good for 1.2 kV one, or 1,200 volts at 6 amps. So these can take surge currents and so forth. So if you're going to do solid state vacuum tube, uh, that's the way to go. All right. So there's a lot of things to, to think about. Um, what type of what type of filtering are you going to use? The simplest is to just take your rectifier, come out of it, and then go across it with a capacitor. So you just take your capacitor. Um, your cap would fill in the ripple of that power supply and smooth it out, and that's it. On a very low-end amplifier, that's all you see a lot of times. Sometimes they don't even have a full wave. Sometimes it's only a half wave. Now, there's lots of videos out on full wave, half wave, different types of rectifiers and power supplies. So I'm not going to get into that on this. There's plenty you can find out on YouTube. Um, Uncle Doug is one site that I've seen. He did a whole series on that sort of thing. And uh, he's, he specializes in guitar amplifiers. So you can learn some of the things about guitar amps from him. All right, so he does a fantastic job. But uh, the other way is to use what we call a Pi filter network. And there's two types, all right? The reason it's called a Pi, let's see if I can find a little pen here. The reason it's called a Pi is it looks like the symbol, the Greek symbol, Pi. Okay, so there's you have your capacitors okay so you have your input and your output okay so you come out of your rectifier whatever it is you know your diode or your tube whatever okay and you go into that and you have your first capacitor which is usually a little bit smaller value okay especially with the tube because you can't overload that tube it's a lot less forgiving than a solid state then it goes through either a coil or the lower end ones, you just use a resistor. Okay, so there's a, this would be called an LC Pi filter, and this, if you had the resistor, would be called an a RC Pi filter. Okay, and the combination of these three elements here will cause a very, very quiet output. These are very efficient. They work really well. Um, you know, there's a lot of solid state, you know, regulated, highly regulated power supplies out there, switch modes, all kinds of things you see. But really, this is an old design, and for vacuum tube amplifiers, it still works really, really well. Um, now, pros and cons. A resistive one doesn't work quite as well. The resistor produces heat, okay? Um, it usually adds more resistance to the circuit, DC resistance we're talking, not, not impedance, okay? But it is very inexpensive and it works. And it does filter the noise out of the power supply and give you a pretty good DC. The coil is better. Usually a coil has lower resistance than a resistor in the same type of circuit. Um, it has better current limiting capabilities, okay, so these, depending on how many Henry's this coil is, you can very, very accurately control 
the maximum current flow through this circuit by this. Okay? And it actually does a little better job of cleaning up the power. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. The downside, okay? Um, look how big that is. Now there's little, there's smaller ones, but if you look at this, we talked about 300 MA. This is only a 5 Henry at 300 MA DC. Look how big. Look at this piece. I mean, look at my hand. Look at the size of this transfer, this choke. It's just a choke coil. It's one coil of wire wrapped around an iron core. That's all there is to it. And look at the amount of real estate this is going to take up on your chassis. But if you want it to be designed properly, now some people will put an undersized coil. They'll put a little tiny choke in there. But that choke's not really doing you any good because it's not matching the circuit properly. Okay? So it's not going to regulate the current and it's not going to filter the noise as efficiently as if you had the correct component. You can't get around the iron when it comes to a tube amp. They're going to be heavy they're going to be inefficient and they're going to have a lot of iron in them. Again, a vacuum tube amplifier isn't green, okay? Vacuum tubes are orange and they're sometimes blue glow, but vacuum tubes are never green, okay? Um, if you're into efficiency and conservation, this is not the way to go, guys. You're going to spend an awful lot of power to produce an awful little bit of power, okay? So, again, great big transfer, but you got to have it. If you want this to work right, you got to have the correct components. All right? So, the type of filtering. Now, next is your types and values of the capacitors you're using. All right? So, again, you're typically going to see, you know, 40 to 80 microfarads, something like that for the first one, and then you can put a larger one on the output, maybe 220, okay? I'm just making these numbers up right now, but that's how that works. This is going to current limit the current coming from your vacuum tube, so it, you, there's a maximum capacitance you can put directly on the plate of a vacuum tube rectifier. If you exceed that, you may cause that tube to flash over and to arc and you will damage the tube. So you don't want to exceed that, so you put the smaller capacitance within the tolerance of that tube on this end. The coil will then, or the resistor, will limit the maximum current so it never exceeds the current limit of the tube and so it will slowly charge this bigger capacitor up. This capacitor here plays an important role. This guy keeps filling the bucket up with electrons, right? And this is a big bucket when it's 220 microfarads. So it gives you a lot of power so that when you have a, an impulse, like a heavy bass note or something like that, it can draw out of this. Because you may exceed the current of this circuit temporarily, not for long, but temporarily. This will fill in that gap. That's what it's there for. Okay? So, the capacitors are important. The other thing is, even though this may be 300 volts out when it's all working with, with a load on it, with no load, this could be 500 volts maybe. So, you have to make sure your capacitor has a high enough voltage rating to take the maximum voltage it's ever going to see. All right? And finding a 450 or 500 volt capacitor these days is not easy. They're out there, but they're expensive and there's not a lot of places that sell them anymore because there's not as much tube gear out there as there used to be. So make sure you don't scrimp on your capacitors. Okay? Um, get the right ones. Okay. I'm going to stop this video right here because it's starting to get really long. And when we come back for part two, we're going to start out on the preamp and driver section. We've, we've designed our output section. We've, you know, we've talked about that in our power supply. Now we're going to talk about, like I said, start, start at the back and work your way towards the front, okay? 
you're going to take your output and you're going to go back to the front there. Okay, back to the front. Does that make sense? I don't know. Anyhow, so we're going to do the preamp and drivers and talk about that and finish up how to design it. And then I'm going to show you some examples of amplifiers. And then I'm going to show you what I came up with and why I, why I chose what I chose. All right, so that'll be part two. So this ends part one. I um, hope I didn't bore you to death by talking your leg off. Uh, and I promise you we'll get some action here once we get through the first couple of parts and we start getting components and start doing the actual work. Hopefully it'll get a little more interesting for you. But I think this, this would be good for you to know. All right. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you at part two.